Right, hello everybody. Um, I'm Simon, Chairman of the Manchester Branch and Northwest Regional Organiser. Uh, known to some of you, not known to all of you. Um, those that we've not, I've not met personally before, uh, you've probably received my emails, you've probably um, had, had phone calls from me perhaps. So, I'm also one of the candidates for the forthcoming May elections. I'm standing in the Farnworth Ward. We've got other candidates in this room. Um, we've got our man Harry there, we've got, we've got Neil, we've got Liam, we've got Brian. Good stuff too. Uh, tonight I want to talk to you a little bit more generally though about wider societal issues and a little bit about myself, my values, why I joined for Britain and um, I want to talk to you about how that relates to the wider values of our society and how, how, how we could move forward together. Um, right, tell you a bit about myself then. Um, 52 years of age, um, I was born in Surrey. Um, it's, how do you phrase this these days? Um, I refer to myself as being half cast because that's the way I was brought up to speak honestly and just straightforward. So half cast it is. I was told more recently though, you're not allowed to say that along with everything else that you're not allowed to say these days. I said, well, what am I not allowed to say? Well, you have to say mixed race these days. Say, so, well, why do you have to say that? Because half caste is offensive. What? Well, if I'm comfortable with it, why would anybody else not be? Now, this seems like a very strange manipulation of language. Two words, the word half, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. And the word caste, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. So why would anybody, anybody take offence? I don't understand this modern world that we're in where language is getting manipulated to suit other people's ends and to clamp down on what, what, what we are saying and how we say it, right? Plain, ordinary, straight talking. That's the way we used to be and that's the way we ought to be. So that's the way I refer to myself. Um, let me tell you how that came about a bit. Um, I was brought up in a white British family um, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, my mum, she had a, a little bit of an affair somewhere down the line with a Pakistani lad. Um, that's kind of ancient history. It's not something that I ever push my mum for any details with. I really don't feel the need to, to, to make her in any way, shape or form uncomfortable. Now, my dad what brought me up, I have two older brothers as well, but it's a bit peculiar, isn't it? Because you're like the little brown kid in a white family and this is like 1970s England. It was a touchy time. It was economically challenged, wasn't it? There was IMF bailouts, hyperinflation, or virtually hyperinflation, industrial action, and um, some extreme right and extreme left sort of political organisations. Um, so as a kid, you, you're kind of insulated from that. But I think at that time, though, everybody was kind of aware there was a lot of strife. A lot of strife. Um, now, coming through school in sort of early part of school in Surrey and then later on from 1976 onwards into London, there, you know, when it, when it comes to like name, name calling as kids do, I was called just about every racist name under the sun. I've heard them, I've heard them all, as kids do. Now, I tell you now, I have not carried any of this into my adult life. And that's because, as adults, we leave our childhood behind, right? There are some who carry these things forever. Victims, people like, and I'm speaking now, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you, David Lammy, who's made a, a career out of being a victim. I, I, to me, that's kid stuff. Do you know, and the name calling, if it wasn't being called out for that, you're being called out for being ginger, or you're being called out for being fat, because that's children. That's what children do, you know? So um, I never had any doubts about the love that my dad had for me and the upbringing that I had. We had everything that we needed, um, never went hungry, and um, it, was, it was a good upbringing. It was a good upbringing. The reason that came about is because my dad had certain values and certain principles. Now, to describe my dad, he was a man of his generation. He was born in 1925. He might be considered lower middle class, basic admin clerical jobs for the council, most of his work in life. Never earned more than 19,000 in his entire life. So he was not a rich man by any standard. But he was a man of, um, of um, steadfast um, 
faith in himself, I suppose. He would have been a Christian with a small c. Um, he wouldn't be bragging about it. He wouldn't be shouting about it. He started out Church of England. He became a Catholic to marry my mum. And he had a choice, didn't he? Two, two older brothers I have, seven and eight years older than me. My dad had a choice after my mum had an affair. He could have walked away, but he didn't, did he? He chose to forgive, and he carried on with his family responsibilities because that was the kind of man that he is, right? Or was, should I say. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because a person's values and a person's beliefs matter. That person is shaped by the country and the culture around them. Different persons in different parts of the world are likely to hold different beliefs, that's fair enough. But what holds us all together is our common values and our, our standards and our belief systems. Now I just want you to imagine if you would, if the situation was reversed and a mirror image of that situation had occurred elsewhere. Imagine if you would, instead I was born to a Pakistani woman in Pakistan by an English white husband. Ask yourself, what would have happened to that woman? What would have happened to that child? And how would that husband, how would her Pakistani husband reacted had she had an affair with an English man, English white man. The values would have been very different and the outcome would have been very different. So relating to my personal experience, I think it is important, deeply important, that we have a strong sense about what is right, what is wrong, who we are, where we're going together on this journey as a society, you know? As I grew, as I got older, I think maybe I was a product of my society as well. Now the late 70s, early 80s, difficult times, culturally a very rich time of course. Um, but I was a wild young fella, getting up to all the stuff that wild young fellas get up to. Too many dodgy substances, too many fighting with the police, too much of this, too much of that, too much excesses on all fronts. But eventually, eventually, I developed myself a little bit of an interest in motorcycles. That was my thing in my sort of early 20s, if you like. I could never really afford to maintain them, so I had to learn how to maintain them myself. Now, through a strange series of events, I ended up moving to Southern Ireland, I ended up moving to Dublin. I won't bore you with the details, it'd be too long of a story. But that's where I lived for the next 22 years. Um, I finished in Dublin in 2012. But in that period, I turned my interest in bikes and I turned that into, into a small business, which I grew. I'd done the City and Guilds Motorcycle Mechanics course with FOSS, you probably know FOSS and Marie. Great organisation, fantastic organisation. And um, I went into business for myself in 1997. Now, those of you who have been in business for yourself, you know it's, it's a measure of you. It's a massive learning curve. You'll get tested time and time again, probably even on a daily basis, you know? But that's the way it was, and I turned that little business into a main Suzuki dealership, and I traded through the good years, and I traded through, well, the good years being the Celtic Tiger, as they called it, and I traded through the bad years. I traded through the credit crunch years. And they were very testing times for Ireland, as indeed they were for Portugal, Spain, and Greece. I've seen things in that time that nobody should really have to see. I've seen taxi drivers fighting in the ranks over fares. I've seen factory closure after factory closure after factory closure. I've seen entire towns and villages empty out and become decimated. I've seen mothers crying at airports as the queues for Canada and Australia and New Zealand. I've seen, well, it was a tough time. A lot of people got hurt. A lot of very good people got hurt. 
but it suited me to go through that process as a self-employed person. That was, that's what I was at that point in time. Now, a dear friend of mine that I rented uh, the, the bike shop off of for many, many years, um, he came and collected rent off of me every Friday morning. That's the way he liked it, in cash. Good man himself. Um, I watched him for many years, 17 years in fact, I watched him and he seemed to have a very, very easy life, you know. He'd collect his little bit of rent off me and then he'd go off somewhere else and collect a little bit more rent and he'd sit around drinking cups of tea and putting cash in his pocket all day. I thought, I'll have some of that, that looks good, that looks great, you know. How can I get in on this? So, through another strange series of events, I learnt to do property investment. And I won't bore you with the details of that either, but to this day now, I have a small property portfolio that just sustains me in a very, very modest way. And that's comfortable, that's all I need. I don't need nothing much more, right? The reason I tell you these things, my life story if you like, is because there is a common theme that runs all the way through. From being a wild young fella, doing lunatic speeds on fast bikes, being self-employed and answerable to no one, and having exited work as such through investment. And that common theme is my insatiable craving for freedom. That is what motivates me more than anything. So, talking to a room full of patriots, you may well be surprised to hear that I'm not particularly patriotic. That's not my buzz, it's just not, that's not what turns me on. What does turn me on is freedom. I want to be free, and it's, 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 it's what pushes and motivates me. But then I'm looking at the world around us, and I'm looking especially at the way Western Europe's going and Britain and the UK are going. And over the course of my adult life, I think it's fair to say I've watched just about every civil liberty we've ever had being slowly legislated away up until about five years ago. Now we're watching it being rapidly, rapidly legislated away. We're now at a stage where it feels to me, certainly, like almost virtually everything is illegal. Does anybody ever get that feeling? You get that feeling? <laughs> exactly. Have you got a license for that? And it's getting ridiculous. Um, a license for a fishing rod. Not a license to go fishing. Not a license to take a fish out of a canal. You can buy a fishing rod, stick it in the cupboard under your stairs for 20 years, never use it. You've got to have a license along with the license for every other bloody thing, the permission for everything. The yes sir, the no sir, the begging for, for... And do you know what? We accept it. We take it. We take it time and time again. Why do we take it time and time again? Because we've got used to it. And because we know that when we do speak up, we're ignored. Anne-Marie, I think. Anne-Marie gets the freedom thing. I really believe you do. I was watching a video of yours a few months ago, short video, you were talking to somebody, for the life of me I don't remember quite who, could have been Avi Yemeni. But Anne-Marie said, I'm going to paraphrase, not an exact quote, but Anne-Marie said, the purpose of government is to protect the people, protect the borders, provide a legal framework and then get out of people's way. Isn't that what Anne-Marie said? So, I heard that, and do you know what? She was on my YouTube screen, but if you had been in the room, I would have kissed you, you know? It's like, it's like somebody that finally gets it, a politician that finally isn't overinflated with their, own, with their own sense of ego and trying to justify their jobs by enforcing more legislation on us, but somebody that realises that government has become a hindrance rather than a help. I want to talk to you as well about Northern Ireland. Having spent 22 years in Southern Ireland, having retained my British passport all that time, having a party leader that's from Dublin, Northern Ireland is, it really, I really think it is such an important piece of our collective cultural identity. Everybody has a view on Northern Ireland. Um, it's obviously been a very, very troubled place, but it's made up of people that are either passionately Irish or passionately British. And it has yet its own separate but unique identity and culture. 
It's really quite beautiful. If you've never been to Northern Ireland, go and have a look at the North Antrim coast. If you've never been to Derry, it's a very historic city. If you've never been to Belfast, the nightlife's pretty good. Go and have a look. It's a sensitive subject, though. It's a very, very sensitive subject for Southern Ireland. It's a very sen sensitive subject for Northern Ireland. And it's a very sensitive subject for, for the rest of the UK. It's a very sensitive point that the EU are trying to exploit right now. Stirring up unnecessary division and pain and sad, poor memories from the past. I want you to just think about this. Just think about this for the moment. Imagine, if you would, how much healing there could be if we had in number 10 Downing Street the UK's first lady Irish Prime Minister. Think about the unity of that. Just think about the power of that for one moment. Nobody, nobody could argue with that. It would sue everybody. Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, Britain, I feel, I feel. That's something that the EU could not drive a wedge between. It's just a thought. It's a little way away, but it's a thought. Huh? Yeah, they're very deeply unhappy people, aren't they? They are very deeply unhappy people. You know? It's not, it's not politics they need, it's psychiatry they need. Okay. The subject of culture, of course. Um, it's impossible to talk about it without talking about the rise of Islam in the West. And um, we feel it because it's on our doorstep and we feel it because it's in the north, Northwest especially. Um, it is the elephant in a room. It's a difficult subject. It's always a difficult subject. It's, um, it's like a little bit of a, a minefield, I suppose, you know. Um, we could, as a society, bury our heads in the sand. We could do that. Um, it wouldn't be a very smart thing to do. Um, we know the population of Islamic population of, of Britain doubles every 13 years. That's um, according to census. That's according to Central Statistics Office. Um, a quick guide to that you'll find in in, in, Wiki, in Wikipedia, of course. Um, and we are witnessing, as the population grows, an exorcism or exercising of greater political influence and more and more direction of central government. We know we have. Um, Muslim Council of Britain directing the British Army. We know we have them directing um, government policy in places such as the Home Office. This is this is not this is not uh, contentious at all. This is just the way it is right now. A lot of you guys in this room now, I suppose, are going to be um, fairly clued in on the subject of Islam. Um, there will be one or two maybe that, that aren't. Um, this will be going out on YouTube, so I'm going to say this anyway, whether you guys know it or not. There is this phrase that gets banded about, and it's in the common vernacular now, and it's in, um, it's in people's psyche, because if you repeat something often enough, that's the way you'll, you'll plant the ideas in the wider public mind. And the phrase is, it's an Abrahamic religion. Have you ever heard that? Who's heard that? Yeah. You, you've heard that. It's an Abrahamic religion. Well, I wonder what that means. What does that, what does that mean? Well, you know, it could have been derived from the prophet of Abraham way back when. Officially, yeah, that's what it means. But does that, does that what it, is that what it means to the man in the street? I've got a theory. I've got a theory that what it means to the average man in the street is something like this. Well, they've got Allah. We've got God. We've got Jesus. They've got Muhammad. It's the same thing, isn't it? And I think that's the thinking pattern. That's exactly what the train of thought with a lot of people. It's an Abrahamic religion. Same thing. If our one's about peace, their one's about peace. Only it isn't the same thing, is it? There's so many fundamental differences. And um, I'm going to run through some of them now. And... The differences between, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, I'm going to keep this brief. Our basic thought system, our basic belief, I say when I say us, I'm talking about Christian heritage, European West, 
um, and of course the Anglosphere, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and America, the Western world. Our thought process comes from essentially Greek philosophy, Roman law and Christian ethics. Now we can discuss and debate and talk and argue and there are some things we're not going to argue about. There are some things that we all take reasonably for granted that there is a certain standard that you wouldn't drop below or the certain things that you don't do. Now, turn, talking of the Christian ethic, the very basis of our legal system is our Christianity. God created all men equal and there's only one power higher than man and that is God. That statement there itself is why justice is blind. On top of the old bailey, the statue wears, justice wears a blindfold and has the scales of justice. Blind to your colour, blind to your age, blind to your gender, blind to your class, blind to your wealth, blind to your sexuality. You will be judged on the empirical data, the evidence and its balance of probability. That is the point of that statue on top of the old bailey. That's the very point of that. Islam comes from a completely different ethical standpoint. Islam does not see everybody as equals. Allah did not create all men equal. Allah sets the Muslims above everybody else. It is supremacist, it is racist, it is sexist, it is homophobic, it is intolerant. If you're a Muslim, you will be dictated. You will be dictated to who your friends are, what to eat, how to eat it, when to pray, how to pray, who you can associate with, what you can do, what you can't do. It will remove thought and will remove freedom. It is political as well as spiritual. It is legal, it is financial, it is cultural, it is social. It is a total system for living. It is a totalitarian ideology. Now, individuals, of course, have, an, uh, have a choice in how much of that they follow. Um, but as it grows, it will return to a more conservative, orthodox position, I think. That's certainly the trend. That is certainly the trend. Now, that is a major sticking point for me, and I think it's a major sticking point for you people in this room. Anybody that values freedom is going to see a rather worrying trend with the growth of Islam. We also have in this country a 350 year very proud tradition of protecting Jewish community who have often found themselves on the very sharp end of a stick throughout Europe and in other parts of the world. But we have a tradition of being offering protection to those guys. That is something we ought to be very, very proud of. Throughout Europe now, there is a rise in anti-Semitism. Throughout Europe now, there is a rise in homophobia. We're seeing a little bit of an increase in the UK too. This seems to be with the rise of Islam and the rise of pretty much unfettered, undocumented immigration out of the third world. Now, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert. I'm not saying there's a cause. I'm saying there's possibly a cause. Go and have a look yourselves. Let me know, what do you think? As this immigration flood continues, and it will on the back of the Global Migration Pact that has recently been signed in Morocco, as the immigration increases, as the spread of Islam and the growth of it increases in this country, what do you think will happen? Will the violence increase or will it decrease? Will the persecution increase or decrease? What's your, what's your views? Who says increase? Yeah. Who says decrease? <coughs> Nobody, okay. Pretty sentiment, we're on the same page. Our political establishment, our wonderful Labour and Tory party, 
I use the singular because they're virtually the same bloody thing. For all as long as I can remember all my adult life, they talk about the economy. They talk about the NHS. It's NHS economy. Economy, NHS. That's all they talk about. The last two and a half years has been a welcome break because now it's economy, NHS and Brexit. Brexit, economy and NHS. They don't talk about much else really, do they? There is more to our lives and more to our society than just economics and the NHS. There is our culture, our traditions and our values. We have to live with our culture on a daily basis. It affects each and every one of us. Now, we know culture changes and we know it evolves, but we know it can also be set. We know a culture can be set. If you think of uh, an experience going into a business perhaps, and you've been into some, some business, and the staff were good, the management good, the product was good, the service was good, and the experience was good. And then maybe the following day you go into a business, and the service was crap, and the staff were poor, and the management were poor, because the culture of the place is poor. The culture of the place is set in any organisation by the people at the top. They're paid the big salaries, they have the big perks, and it's up to them to put in place the processes, the systems, and the training for the people below them. We have an unaccountable public sector as such. God bless them, some of them are trying, some of them work very, very hard. They're up against it. It's the culture of the place. If you're in, I don't know, maybe the Department of Agriculture or something, or if you're working in a council, you're a small cog in a very big machine. And I think quite often people get into those jobs, they're young, they're fit, they're energetic and they're dynamic, and they try, they really, really do try. But the system within the place grinds them right down. And before long, they just end up very disillusioned, very despondent. Well, that is the culture of the place. Did you ever go into a council or into a civil service place and come out of it feeling like nobody really wants to help you, nobody really, want, nobody really cares, right? To give you an example, you go into most private businesses, you're going to be met with a smile, you're going to be met with somebody who wants to help you. That's what you're going to be met with. If you go into a public sector office, you'll see the first... The first thing you'll see is a sign on the wall, and the sign says, abuse and assault of our staffs will not be tolerated. Interesting, and they're quite right. You shouldn't have to put up with that at work. But why does the sign exist? And why don't you see it in Pizza Hut? Why is it not there? Or why is it not in a Ford dealership when you walk in? Why did they get assaulted? Why did they, why did they, why did they get abused? Is it because the public are frustrated with them? Is it because dealing with them is so damned difficult? And if so, why? Well, the mantra, of course, is always, it's the cuts, it's the cuts, it's the cuts. Well, it isn't always the cuts, is it? It's the culture, right? It is the culture, and the culture is set by the people at the top. And as we have written in our manifesto, Public Sector Accountability, this is a subject that is very, it's probably my favourite policy, I have to say. This is something we, we really need to change, is the culture of these places. Culture affects every aspect of our life. It's the way we, the way we view ourselves, the way we view our past, the way we view our future. It is ourselves and it is our hope and it is our aspirations. The political establishment has for decades, five decades at least, thrown everyone together um, from all sorts of places. We've all been thrown together, whether we like it or not. There's been some difficult adjustments. Um, I, think, I think actually Britain's done a pretty good job of being, becoming a multiracial society. I think we've done a great job of that. I think we can all pat ourselves on the back about that actually. Um, 
but we've done it. We've done it because those early generations of immigrants coming out of the West Indies or coming out of India or coming out of the British Commonwealth had a very fresh memory of what empire was and with empire the Commonwealth. And so we were inviting people to this country that were on the same page as us, that had democracy, that had education. Many of them from 3,000 miles away would have had a picture of the Queen on the classroom wall, you know? So they got here, we made our difficult transition, but we made our transition. But times have changed, and that was 50 years ago. And the kind of immigration we've had for the last 15 years has been a very, very different thing, I think. For a start, well, 50 years ago, we thought we, thought we had a flood of immigration, but that's nothing compared to the last 15 years, is it? Our institutions aren't keeping up, our schools aren't keeping up with it, our education system isn't keeping up with it. And marie recently made a video about um, the cost of translations for the NHS and the legal service. So, the people that are coming now, often from Africa, parts of Africa that were never had a British influence, um, people that really aren't old enough to remember the empire or commonwealth or any of that stuff or what it meant. People that are coming purely for what they've seen on the internet. And quite often what they've seen on the internet, well, I think some quite negative things and maybe they get the wrong impression about the West, you know? I think maybe they get the impression that Western women are a little bit loose because of some of the stuff they see on the internet. But that's, that's what you see on the internet quite often is a fiction, isn't it? It's not the reality. <laughs> So, these new cultures coming in, at the rate they're coming in, aren't really giving a chance to assimilate properly, are they? Not getting a, a chance to integrate properly. And that's where we get a culture clash. That's where we get friction. And culture clash is a very real thing, because it is in the vernacular, isn't it? The common vernacular. We all know the term culture clash. So... If, if there's too many clashes, too intense, too frequently, that could lead to a lot of problems. That could lead to a lot of problems. We, we already have it. I think we already have ethnic tension in Britain. There's a lot of stuff going on out there that media aren't reporting. They're just kind of glossing over. Um, the thing at Birmingham, with the teaching LGBT stuff in the schools, that was, that was underplayed in the media. Then there was the near riot at the school in Sheffield that didn't get any media coverage at all. And there's oh, a dozen, dozens of inc incidences like that. Little things here, little things there. Now, my worry, of course, is that these little local cultural clashes, tit for tat stuff, could turn into sectarian violence five years, 10 years, 15 years. And that sort of thing turns into civil wars. Civil wars are preceded by ethnic tensions. And I think we've got ethnic tensions right here, right now. Now, we would be accused, just having this conversation here today, we would be accused of stirring it up. I think it's quite the opposite, in fact. I think burying your head creates even more problems. I think the conversation needs to be had, and I think it needs to be had intelligently, and I think it needs to be had articulately. And I think probably the person that is articulating it, articulating it the most intelligently is our very own Anne-Marie Waters. Um, our existing politicians, they don't want to know. They don't want to know about culture. They just want to talk about the NHS. They don't want to talk about underlying ethnic tensions. They want to sabotage Brexit. They're not dealing with the stuff that is affecting all of us on our daily lives. They're not dealing with the things that, frankly, wind us up, like phoning a utilities company and not being able to get any help from anybody, or um, we're still phoning a utilities company and being on hold for 20 minutes. That's the sort of stuff that pisses people off. That's where the stress is. That's where the tension is. You know, not knowing your neighbours or living next door to somebody for 20 years and not even speaking the same language. 
These are, the, these are the little things that Westminster bubble doesn't have to deal with. They don't have to think about this. This affects you and it affects I, me. It affects each and every one of us. Culture is important. Our values are important. And to have a functioning society, we need social cohesion. Social cohesion only happens when we're all on the same place and we have similar values. We don't all have to think exactly the same. But with the big stuff, we do all need to be on the same page at least. There's a lot, there's a lot of talk these days about British values. And I hear that being banded around a lot. I know we're all genuinely behind Anne-Marie Waters. I've never heard a bad word said. Everybody seems to just say, that woman reflects my views, you know? She's speaking for us all. But in the wider society, there's a lot of talk about British values. I hear people on the left talking about what it is. I hear people in the centre talking about what it is. I hear all sorts of people talking about what British values are. There's, I don't know what you call it, maybe I don't, an underlying psychology or reverse psychology to that perhaps. It's interesting that we should even be having that conversation with ourselves that it keeps cropping up. Is, is there anybody else that is, is, is aware of what I'm talking about? Has anybody else had this conversation, British values cropping up? You know what I'm talking about? Good, good, good. It suggests to me that as a society, we're not very confident in ourselves and we're not very clear in ourselves as to what it actually means. I don't remember my parents having that conversation I don't think gra my grandparents ever had to have that conversation. I think they knew what British values were. I think they knew instinctively. It was unstated because they ate it, slept it and breathed it, breathed it. I don't think they had to have conversations like that. If we've got to have conversations like that, it's because we're feeling insecure about ourselves as a society. That's what I think is going on. So, social cohesion. Underlying ethnic tensions, tit for tat attacks on the internet that happen out there in the street but are making the mainstream media. Social cohesion for want of a better term. It's getting thinner on the ground, it's getting harder on the ground and I think it's going to get harder and harder. Um, it will probably get worse before we as a party have a chance to make things better. Social cohesion used to be done automatically by people that had shared common experiences and shared cultural values. How do you have social cohesion without shared common cultural values? Well, the answer staring us in the face. We have it through legislation, repressive legislation. We have it through surveillance. We have it through policing people's thoughts, we have it through policing people's speech, we have it through doxing, we have it through banning, we have it through fining, we have it through regulation. We force cohesion. It doesn't flow naturally anymore. It seems incredible that we've reached this bizarre point in our societal evolution where we have forced tolerance where the law can legislate for everybody to be tolerant. That's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Forced tolerance. How do you make that work? Isn't that just where everybody has seething, underlying resentment boiling up every now and again? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We've got to start developing a, a, a better sense of ourselves as a country and as a culture. We've got to start believing in ourselves again. We've got to start pushing back that tide of societal insecurity and replacing it with a societal pride. I think for Britain, they're the only party that have any notion about how to do that, quite frankly. If we do nothing, well, political apathy it could be the death of us, couldn't it? The amount of non-voters out there that have just simply given up, and who'd blame them? Labour and Tory, Tory and Labour. If that's the only choice, what's the bloody point? But we have an opportunity now. As a party, we have an opportunity to build and grow our membership, develop our branches, 
develop our regions, develop our voter base, put our councillors into place, and come the general election, put our MPs into place. I'm confident we can do that. We've got a tough road ahead of us, but we can do that. But it is going to take action, real action. What it's not going to take is a few lads sitting in a pub, around a beer, once a month, complaining about the government. Guys, we need to turn talk into action. That's what we've got to do. Now, that action means that the people in this room are going to have to get out and start leafleting, doing street stalls, talking to people, not being shy. If you view politics, don't keep it to yourself. Tell your family and friends. I appreciate that can be difficult, and I appreciate that some people are receptive and other people the barriers go up. If the barriers go up, back off. Drip feed it to them a little bit at a time. They'll come round. We need leaflets done, street stalls done. We need people to write to the newspapers. We need more and more people managing social media and getting the message out that way. We need, we need, we need to get ourselves together. We need, we need more and more ca ca candidates. We've actually done really well, I think, this year, haven't we, uh, Emery? We've got, we've got a lot of candidates. There's something like 450% increase on last year. Has any, any other party done that? I no. No, but I doubt it. I doubt it. Four, roughly 450% increase. 15 councillors last year, 100 this year. Maybe slightly under 100 this year, but roughly 450%. That's pretty bloody good, lads that's, and lasses. That's good, that's good. But we need to do more, we need to do a lot more. It's not enough to have councillors running in elections, we need to actually win elections. It's gonna take work, it's gonna take getting off your ass and getting out on the streets, that's what it's gonna take. You guys have come to listen, I suppose, to Anne-Marie, not to be lectured by me. You're getting the lecture. Because I'm looking at a room full of activists now, not people that have just come to sit and listen, but people who are going to put in the work. If you don't put in the work, if you don't take action now, I think it's going to come a point, there could come a point, when you're lying on your deathbed, looking your granddaughter in her eye through the slit in her burka <laughs> and you'll have to explain to her why you left it up to other people. <coughs> Can I count on you people for some action? Can I count on you for some activism and for some leafleting? Good man, good man. Any others? Come on. Come on, you have about a third of the room. Come on, come on, come on. Right, okay, okay, okay. We've got some people, we've got some people. So. At the end of tonight, look for the lads with the notepads and pens. Make sure you give their names and addresses to them, yeah? And we'll get in touch. We'll get in touch with you. And we'll get you organised around our candidates. We've got Neil there. We've got Chris there. We've got myself. We've got Liam. So we divide you guys that have volunteered into teams for the four candidates. And we'll go out intensively marketing ourselves to the public, yeah? Okay. Thank you.